Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Messiah Yeshua was willing to lay down his life for you and me. And not just lay it down, but to submit to a horrible death. We have seen that he has been beaten, he had been mocked, he had been tortured, he had been flogged, and now he was heading to the place where he would be crucified. And my hope is this, that all that he suffered, you would understand that he did so for you. And what motivated him to do this, endure all this suffering, was the great love that he had for you. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is this, am I going to receive that love? And the only way that you can do so is faith in that gospel, believing in why he died for your sins and mine. And though he died and was buried, on the third day he rose from the dead. And it's this resurrection that gives us victory that informs us of the victory that we can have over sin, that we don't have to live in disobedience to God's will, but through the receiving of the Holy Spirit by faith in Messiah, that we can live an obedient life, a praiseworthy life, a life that glorifies our God. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the Gospel of John and John chapter 19. The book of John and chapter 19. Now, all of this is taking place on Passover, a day that we should focus in on God's provision. We need to remember that on Passover, God gave the Hebrews in Egypt a command, a commandment to take the lamb, sacrifice it, place the blood visibly so that he might see it. So the people are called to appropriate the blood, deal with the blood of the lamb. And that's what you and I are called to deal with, the blood of the lamb of God, Messiah Yeshua. And it's only when we do so are we going to experience that redemption, that new life, that life which is not rooted in this world, but rooted in a coming kingdom. Well, we left off last week with Yeshua being led away, Pontius Pilate, he had given in to the desires of the Jewish leadership. And he was willing for the sake of keeping his position as a ruler to have an innocent man, one that he said over and over three times, I find no guilt whatsoever in him. Pontius Pilate was the type of leader that would have such a righteous, innocent man be put to a horrible death in order that he might hold on to the things of this world that pleased them so much. And it tells us something. You might get everything that you desire in this world, but you'll live for eternity in regret because you did not respond to Yeshua properly. So you need to ask yourself, I need to ask myself daily, Am I responding to Yeshua properly? In this decision I make, that decision I make, those things that I do, how I speak, am I doing so in order to please Him? If not, then you are much more like Pontius Pilate than you are a servant of God. Well, we saw that he was led out to a place called Gagatha. And look now to verse 18 because there is where he's going to be crucified. And with them are going to be two others. Now, that's going to fulfill something, biblically speaking. But we're also going to see how Yeshua's cross impacted people's life. We're going to learn from another gospel 
that one of those people who were crucified with him, although he cursed him initially, in the end, he came to faith. Meaning, how Yeshua died impacted this man's life. And the fact that Yeshua would die in such a manner for you and for me should impact every decision we make. So, once again, he was in Golgotha where he was crucified, where they crucified him, and with two others, one on one side and one on the other, and Yeshua, he was in the middle. Verse 19. And Pilate wrote also a title, and he set it upon the cross, and it was written, Yeshua, the, the one from Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Now, this is important because Pilate is saying something, that he is indeed for everyone, and we'll see this in a moment, for everyone to see that Yeshua, this crucified one, is the king of the Jews. Now, I want to deal with something that uh, many people recently are, are saying, and although it sounds great, and although it is factual in regard to the identity of Yeshua, it is wrong when we try to use gimmicks and try to sensationalize things in a way that we should not, in a way that the Scripture does not revere. Why do I say that? Well, this, this title that was placed upon the cross, it's becoming very popular to people say, hey, we know that it was written in a series of language. It was written in Greek, it was written in Latin, and it was also written in Hebrew or Aramaic, I believe, Hebrew. And if we say that in Hebrew, we would say, Yeshua Handotri Malak HaYudim. Yeshua from Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Now, people will say, if you write that in Hebrew, and you only put the first letter of each word, that it spells Yud, He, Vav, He, those four letters that when they're put together, they, they spell what we can call that sacred name of God, what, what properly is, is pronounced as Yehovah, or what wrong people who do not know Hebrew will call Yahweh. It's not Yahweh, it's Yehovah. Now, why is that so important? Well, even though he is Jehovah God, when we look at the Greek, and we rightly translate it into Hebrew, it does not spell that name. Anyone who teaches that is incorrect. The basis for such a statement is not grammatically sound, but it sounds so good, people will get excited. Let me tell you, I don't need gimmicks to get me excited over God's word. Take it for what it is. It simply says that he wrote on the cross, look at it again, he wrote upon the cross that Yeshua is, from Nazareth, is the king of the Jews. Therefore, this place, uh, uh, this title, at uh, this place where the title was written, it says many would read it of the Judeans because near to the city was a place where Yeshua was crucified. So Pilate, in putting that upon the cross, this, this, this title, Many people saw it of the Jewish leadership, that he was the Messiah. That's how they would understand it. And it was written, as it says, in Hebrew and in Greek and in Latin. Now, if you're using a, a translation that is not based upon the Texas Receptus, the order of the languages are going to be different. But it says Hebrew or Aramaic, depending upon your, your thought in uh, uh, that word, Greek and Latin. And therefore, the high priests of the, the Judeans, they said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but only that that one said that I am the king of the Jews. Now, Pilate, he had, 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 had how can I say, uh, submitted to almost everything the leadership won. But at this last time, he says, no, what I have written, I have written. It was, in other words, important. We see a, a violation of what Pilate had done throughout this discourse. He had always, in the end, given in to what the Jewish leadership wanted. But this time, he would not. Why the, the, the variation? Well, the answer is this. 
in the scripture, when we see a pattern and a change, it is to reveal something. It is to emphasize that, and that's this. Pilate, he believed that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah. But the problem, and I've said this before, he would, would not act upon it. He would not let his life be impacted based upon that, that recognition. The question is, are you? Does your life truly impact, or is your life truly impacted by the faith that you say you have concerning Messiah Yeshua? Well, verse 23. Therefore, and by the way, in the Greek text, so many of the sentences begin with the word un, which is in Greek, therefore. And why it's there, it sounds redundant in English, but it's to tell us that everything that is happening is based upon a previous decision, a previous action. It's a chain reaction. And that gives us also insight for our life. Everything that we do tomorrow is going to be based upon what we have done today, the decisions that we've made. Once more, look at the text, verse, verse 20, 23. Therefore, the soldiers, when they had crucified Yeshua, they took his garments and they, they made them into four. That is, they divided them into four parts, each soldier having a part. But the tunic which uh, he had, that tunic was without seams from the top it was woven throughout all of it. Now, what that is trying to reveal to us is that Yeshua's garment was very valuable. It was a garment that took great care in making. Now, I believe that there's something that's trying to be communicated to us. If you know the scriptures, and we see this going all the way back to the book of Genesis and chapter 3, there's an emphasis upon nakedness there. Remember, the man and the woman stood one time naked, but they were not ashamed. That was something good. And then when they realized their nakedness, what did God do? Well, he covered them with skins so that their nakedness would not be seen. Why? Nakedness in the scripture is related to shame. It is related to deeds and actions that are not pleasing to God. But when we have righteous garments, when we have precious garments, well, that is related to good deeds. So when it talks about Yeshua's garment being woven from top all the way through and without seams, it's speaking about a garment which would have been seen as made perfectly, made in a precious manner, one that would not be good to, to divide up like they did the other garments that he had. And what it's saying is this, that his deeds cannot be destroyed, that he had a precious, a valuable, a perfect deed. What he did at this time was perfection in his laying down of his life. So once more, they said to one another, let us not tear it, but let us cast lots to see to whom it will be. And all of this happened in order that the word might be fulfilled that was spoken. Now, we're moving into something that we've spoken of before, and I want to go back to it. The, the account of Messiah's crucifixion is going to be, be highlighted by a statement. And that statement is, this is happening that the word of God might be fulfilled. This is happening that another word from God might be fulfilled. And all of these words are found in one place, and that is the scripture. So over and over in this section, dealing with the crucifixion, we see an inherent connection between the crucifixion and the fulfillment of God's word. And it underscores that everything that Yeshua did was in order that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now, he, and the scripture bears this out in many places, Yeshua, he is the son of God, meaning that he served God perfectly. But he's also the son of man. And there's many implications in that term, son of man, and we've talked about it. But one of such interpretations of that term, son of man, is an example for us. 
And if we're wise, if we want to be a fellow servant of Yeshua in obeying God his Father, then we need to act, behave, do, speak, every aspect of our being needs so that the Word of God might be fulfilled. Look again. In order that the Scripture might be fulfilled, which was said, they divided my garments among them, and upon my garment they cast lots. Now, what is, is just fabulous about the Word of God is the, the specific way in which it is fulfilled, prophecy is fulfilled. When we look at Yeshua and the things that he did, no other person could carry all of these things out. Now, if we were to look, instead of approaching the scriptures by faith, if we approach them through a, a humanistic, rationalistic, way based upon science based upon what man can know for sure we see something very interesting when we look at all the scriptures about messiah i mean what is the likelihood that they're going to be fulfilled that that someone who is going to be the messiah he has to be born in bethlehem he has to be born before the destruction of the second temple that he's got to be crucified that he's got to be crucified on Passover. And it goes all throughout these things that the scripture says concerning Messiah. And when you look at how many people have ever lived on the face of the world, and you say, all right, how many of them were born in Bethlehem? Well, you're going to get a very small percent. But you have perhaps millions of people who have been born in Bethlehem. Then you have to say, well, how many of them were born before the destruction of the temple. Well, that's going to cut it down further. How many of them were, were crucified? Well, that's going to cut it down to a very small percent. How many of them were crucified on Passover before the destruction of the temple? And then how many of them are going to have their garments both divided up, but also garments cast lot for? So when you see all the things that have to be fulfilled, the likelihood of one person doing that is just gazillions to one and the only one that did was messiah so in the scripture it says it's fulfilled because it's written that his garments they divided among themselves into parts and others they cast it lots for it therefore the soldiers did all these things that the scripture might be fulfilled and they didn't even know they were fulfilling them verse 25 but standing, and this is a, a, in the plural, there standing by the cross of Yeshua was his mother and also his mother's sister and also Mary of uh, uh, Klapas and also Mary Magdalene. Now here again, the scripture is written in a way to convey truth that we might understand the things of God. And what have we learned when women are, are emphasized in the scripture? We have learned that when women take the forefront in a given scriptural passage, it changes the context to redemption. Now, in one sense, we've been talking about redemption because it's Passover. But to underscore that, to emphasize that reality, I mean, there were many people near the cross. But here, John wants to emphasize how many women? Look again, the mother of Yeshua, we find his mother's sister, so his aunt, also the wife of Klapas, and finally Mary Magdalene, four women. Now, what do the number four has to do in this passage? What does four relate to? Well, we talk about the, the four winds of the heavens and the four corners of the earth, meaning north, south, east, and west. You will find among the rabbinical sages of old, they understand that the number four relates to the world. And what does women have to do with here? Redemption. So Messiah's crucifixion, all of this is centered upon, if we read the scripture properly, we are told that at Yeshua's cross, why was there Yeshua's cross? What took place at Yeshua's cross? Here's the answer, the redemption 
of the world. That's why four women staining by the cross. Now, there are those who want to teach, and this is a false doctrine, that Messiah only loved the elect, and he only gave his life for the elect. That's not true. We see in the scripture, for God so loved the world. And in this account, four women to say that he died for the world. Also, we find elsewhere in the epistles that that Messiah didn't just die for us, meaning the believers, but for the sins of the world. So over and over, we see that there's a broadness to the cross. That's what this information is trying to convey to us. And next to those from four women, it says, also the disciple whom Yeshua loved. He was standing there and he says to his mother, woman. Now, this word, word woman is not, if we say woman, oftentimes it's used in a derogatory manner. But in the Greek language, when we say woman in this context, it's a term of respect. It's like using the English term man. Uh, uh, in uh, male, we say, sir, a woman, ma'am. That's what he's saying. It's a term of respect. So he says, woman, he says, your son. And then he speaks to the disciple and he says to him, your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her as his own. Now, what do we have here? Well, we have an event, a historical event, that has scriptural significance for us. It's just not to say it happened. There's a significance for us in that scripture. And what is that? A new relationship. Through his death and his proclamation on the cross, we find that Mary, his mother, received a son, and that disciple received a new mother. What do we have? A new family being created. And why is that so important? Because through the crucifixion and those who respond properly to it, we are brought into a new family. And what is that family? The family of God. It is a kingdom family. And only the cross, his crucifixion, his death, brings it about. Well, let's move on to verse, verse 28. And after these things, Yeshua, knowing all had already been completed, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, he cries out, I thirst. Now, everything about Messiah had already been completed concerning the work of the suffering servant. We need to remember, when we talk about messianic prophecies, there's two types of messianic prophecies. Those having to do with his first coming and those having to do with his second coming. So when he says already everything had been fulfilled for, for, for the scripture in regard to him, it means only in regard to his first coming. Obviously, those scriptures that relate to the second coming, they haven't been fulfilled but all of them, 100% of them, will be fulfilled. But what does he say here? Well, look again, verse, verse 28. After these things, Yeshua, knowing that all had already been fulfilled, but in order that the scripture might be made complete, he says, I thirst. Now, what scripture is he talking about? The answer is the book of Numbers, chapter 9, and verse 11. There it speaks about Passover. Remember, he's the Passover sacrifice. All of this is happening on Passover day, the preparation day. And in the scripture, it says in Numbers chapter 9, verse 11, it says that the Passover sacrifice must be eaten with matzah and also the bitter herbs. So Messiah, he is that Passover lamb. He is also the bread of life. But where's the bitter herbs? They must be partaken of together. So in order that every aspect of Passover might be fulfilled, he says, I thirst. Now, we have to be careful because there are deceitful people. I'm going to say one by name, Tobias Singer. The reason why I label him is because he's intelligent, he is smart, 
but he is deceitful. See, in looking at the New Testament, prior to Yeshua being crucified, we see this in the Synoptic Gospels, they offer him something to drink in order to, to deaden him for a moment so that they can easily put the nails into his, his hands, into his feet for the initial part of the crucifixion. They don't like someone moving around. Yeshua refused to drink. But here he says, I thirst, and we're going to see he does partake of it. Two different events. Tovia Singer, he combines them and says, you know, you have in one gospel, and he gives a citation, Yeshua refusing to drink. And then in the other gospel, he says here, he drinks. Well, that's true. Two different events. He tries to convey they're one in the same. He knows they're not. But in order to mislead people, he will not present the facts accurately. He has to distort them, and that is not pleasing to God. And therefore, I want to emphasize that, hoping that he might repent, or at least be an honest disagreeer, but do it honestly, not through deceit. So Yeshua says, I thirst. What's there? Look now to verse 29. Therefore, there was a vessel of vinegar lying in the midst, lying right there. And therefore, they filled the sponge with vinegar, and they placed it upon hyssop, and they brought it to Yeshua's mouth. And therefore, when he received it, that is, Yeshua received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now, this is important because he took that bitter and now he, the Lamb of God, the bread of life, all of them were together, fulfilling Numbers chapter 9, verse 11, every aspect of the Passover. And therefore, he said, it is finished, and he gave that order. And he bowed his head, and he gave over his spirit. Now, he not only was in control of the arrest, not only did he took control of the trial, but also the crucifixion. He died at the exact minute that he wanted to die. And that has significant implications that we're going to talk about as we move into the last part of John's Gospel and chapter 19. But this Word of God is so specific. Every detail is met. And it couldn't be met by simply a man. No, God had to bring it about. In order that we might know that all of this accomplished God's purposes, God's plans, it was His work in our behalf that we might experience eternal salvation. Until next week, may God bless you. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him.